I promise you're making at least one of these design mistakes. And so am I. Quick disclaimer, I tried to pick things that are more universal and are more about design principles rather than things that indicate class, wealth, status, privilege, etc. But of course, as humans, we tend to make emotional connections between things that aren't inherently related. So things that are particularly large or neutral in color tend to be associated with wealth. There are so many reasons for that, but that's another video. Plus, I'm also making a lot of these design mistakes because of systems of oppression that keep trans and disabled people like me in cycles of poverty. So this isn't a moral judgment on you as a person. It's just a YouTube video from some random person on the internet who doesn't actually know you, who has way too much time to think about pretty things. You were probably drinking that water all throughout whatever I was saying, right? So without further ado, let's get into my top 50 design mistakes. Let me know which design mistakes you're making down in the comments. Now, in no particular order, number one, having a rug that's the wrong size. Now, there aren't many rules in design that I would say are hard and fast rules, but rug size is one of them. You can be a little playful when it comes to like accent rugs, but typically you want the edge of your rug to be about a foot or two from every single wall surrounding it. If your rug is too small, or if you don't have a rug, getting a rug that's properly sized can make your room feel so much bigger and so much cozier, and I, I don't know how to like explain this because there's there's no explaining, but I went from not having a rug in a living room to putting a properly sized rug in there and it sounded different, it felt different, it felt bigger because it included one of the chairs that was kind of off to the side and it made it feel like that was actually part of the space when before it didn't. So properly sized rugs. I probably should not talk that much for every single one of these. Otherwise, I'll have like 10 hours of footage to go through. So, um, number two, not enough or bad lighting. So obviously like fluorescent lighting is bad, but like you see behind me, we've got a candle, we've got a nice up light, we've got a cute little lamp that's all nice and cozy. The dogs are trying to hump each other. Anyways, uh, number three, the wrong sized art. Typically, again, similar to rugs, you want your art to fill up a space. You don't want it to be like within half an inch of the edge of a wall, but you also don't want it to be within like three feet. Oh, nope, 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 nope. This one is off limits. I don't remember what I said about that exactly, but, but you want it to fill up the space properly. Number four, not having any color in your room. I think we all know that the all gray and the all white and the black and white are all kind of like, we've passed that culturally. So add in some color. Number five, not using colors well. So yes, I just told you to use color and there is a wrong way to do it because you've probably seen rooms like this or this and there are specific things you can do to actually use color well. One of the main ones is choosing less saturated colors, but I'll probably make a whole video on this in the future. So let me know if you want that. Number six, ignoring the function of a space. Obviously you want your space to look pretty, but if you're like any average person who isn't having your home photographed for a magazine, it doesn't need to look like a magazine. Obviously the pretty side is great. <laughs> it's my favorite part of design. It's the fun part. But if you prioritize that over the function of a space, it's just not going to work and you're not gonna feel good in the space. Which, perfect segue into number seven, is ignoring how you feel in the space. And this is what design is all about, right? Having good lighting can make your space feel cozy. Having cozy textures can help you feel soothed. Having a properly organized kitchen can help you cook better. So if you don't feel good in your space, that means that something's not working. Number eight, not having anything that is unexpected, funny, or unique. I think it's easy to fall in the trap of doing all the Pinterest things and making it look like everyone else's home because that's what we're kind of told to do, right? But I think it's important and I've been doing this with my wardrobe lately. I haven't gotten it yet, but I ordered a hat off of ThreadUp that's bright red and it just says sports. Mostly I got it because it made me laugh. And if I can incorporate stuff like that into both my wardrobe and my home, I think that that's just a much more pleasant way of interacting with my home. Number nine is sticking to one single design style. I would be hard pressed to find anyone who is strictly boho or strictly industrial or strictly, you know, whatever. Usually you're a mix of a whole bunch of different little things and you've got influences from different bits and pieces of history. And I think that's really fascinating. And I think it's important to understand that and how they all play together. And it just makes a space a lot more cohesive and 
thought out and put together, and I'm rambling. Number 10. This is very specific, but choosing a bad tile layout. I see this a lot with subway tiles specifically, um, because most people don't actually know that the subway tile pattern, there's the brick pattern that most people do subway tile in, and then there's the actual subway pattern, which is more like a set of stairs. I'm not trying to be stingy about like, ooh, this is the right one. You can, you, you can do literally whatever you want. But all of these feel off to me, and all of these don't. You see it, right? Number 11. If you're choosing to do a relatively neutral color palette as the base, the mistake is not incorporating some sort of pop of red or orange or something like that. I know this is really oddly specific, but I feel like a strategically placed pop of red or orange can just take everything from like boring eh, nee, nee, to wow, that's like designed and really like thought out. Number 12, if you have multiple rooms, making all of your rooms look exactly the same. Obviously you want your space to be cohesive, but making everything look exactly the same just kind of falls a bit flat and it just feels uninspiring. And this might feel counterintuitive to literally what I just said, um, but number 13 is not referencing other rooms with colors, shapes, textures, etc. So while you don't want every single room to look exactly the same, you want there to be some cohesive elements throughout. So for example, if you have some black industrial pipe as a shower curtain rod, you might want to have black metal shelf brackets in another room. They're both black metal, they're not exactly the same, but they still give off a similar enough vibe without being copy-paste. Number 14 is being afraid to mix your metals and only using like the mass manufactured painted metals from like Target and HomeSense and all of the other random decor stores. I don't have much to say about this one, but it just, if you mix your metals well, it looks thoughtful and curated, but also if you do it badly, it just looks really unintentional. I should probably make a video about this too. Hmm. Number 15, lampshades that are made of metal or they are otherwise opaque, with the one caveat being unless it is purely for aesthetic purposes, it's like a sculptural piece of art that you're just like, I want to look at this because it's pretty. Because lampshades that don't actually let any light through, surprise, surprise, are not particularly functional. Number 16. I am guilty of this one right now. You do what you gotta do. Number 16 is a boring or a non-patterned couch. I know we've all loved the white couches. I know we've all loved the gray couches. I currently have a warm gray couch. Don't go and throw out your couch if you have a white or a gray couch. But if you're in the market for a new couch, definitely go with something more like this or this or this because your room will instantly look like 10 times more designed if you do something like this, especially like a red and white stripe I've been noticing recently. It's just like so good. And you don't have to put it anywhere near as much effort into trying to like make your space look more cool. It just looks cool. Number 17, when you're painting, the mistake is not painting your trim, your molding, your ceiling, and your doors. Obviously, if you're a renter and you're not allowed to paint those things, eh, there's only so much you can do. But if you're allowed to paint those things, do it. <laughs> painting these things either a slightly darker color than your wall color or a fun accent color can go really far in making your space feel put together. Number 18, I kind of addressed this with the couch situation, but anything that is all gray or all white, whether that's kitchens or couches or bathrooms, anything, it's just boring. The one place I understand all white is in a bathroom when you need to be able to see, especially if you're doing like makeup and stuff like that. Number 19 is not researching or referencing different time periods and or moments in design history. I know that might feel like a lot for the average non-design person who just wants to have a home that like doesn't suck, but if you clicked on this video, odds are you have some level of artistry about your home, and I think that this really helps. Trust me, I was an art major. I had to take two art history classes for my major, and um, I did not want to take them. But after I took those classes, I was like, oh, I actually understand things now, and I actually make better art. <laughs> so I promise it helps. It's kind of boring, but it helps. Number 20. 
This is kind of hard to do because it's hard to find examples that aren't influenced by this, but I think a big mistake is considering English design and English inspired design as the only classic and timeless design style out there. There are so many other things from so many different cultures, and I think it could be really interesting to look into your own personal ethnic background to see what types of design things they were doing with their home. My ancestry is German and Polish, and so I've been really interested in like old armoires and furniture and like built-in beds and stuff that have fun like paintings on them. And it's just really interesting to think about classic and timeless design from a slightly different perspective. Again, beautiful segue into number 21, which is not incorporating anything from your own culture or your family's or loved one's cultures. This one's pretty self-explanatory, but basically just like make your space more personal. Number 22 is refusing to DIY anything. Some DIYs can be really challenging, like building whole entire pieces of furniture, but other DIYs can also be really easy and simple and effective. And even though I've made some uh, pretty questionable DIYs, um, as someone who didn't grow up learning how to use power tools, I found it so empowering. And I know that word is overused and whatever, but it genuinely, <laughs> I feel more powerful now that I know how to use power tools. Number 23, we're starting to see this more and more. This is probably one of the worst mistakes you can make, and that is only buying mass manufactured stuff and or not buying vintage or antiques or going thrifting. Again, pretty self-explanatory. It just adds more character and stories to your space than, you know, going online and clicking add to cart on a bunch of things and then having them show up at your home. That's just, that's not a story. As like an artistic romantic type of person, I just, I love a good story. Number 24, this is a perfect blend of functional and pretty. And this is not using baskets and other containers to help contain your mess and make your home feel less overwhelming. The reason I specifically like the word container is because that is the container, like ideologically speaking, for the things that you put in there. Say you have a yarn collection or a paint collection or a bottle cap collection. I, you have things and you say, this is the container for these things. I cannot have more things than fits in this container. If you get too many things that don't fit in the container, you need to like go through some of them and be like, hmm, which ones don't I want? And that, that container helps you keep your home in check and helps you not buy way too much shit that you don't actually need. The same logic can be applied to shelves or built-in nooks or storage spaces. If you only have this one shelf available for holiday supplies, then you only have that one shelf and you can't put anything outside of the shelf. And that's the rule. I'm talking way too much, oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm dog sitting, and so, um, oh, hi. Oh, oh, you wanna play right now? Oh, are you guys gonna be so loud and noisy during this? Because that would be, you know, super fantastic for my audio. Oh, 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 oh. On a similar note, number 25 is not giving your things specific dedicated homes. This is why we have like the little inserts in silverware drawers to say the forks go here and the spoons go here and the knives go here. That is because of this reason, because if you have all of your silverware just like loose in a drawer, it's chaos. Okay, we're finally halfway through. Number 26, this one goes back to color and that is only using a color once and never referencing it again and or not using any sort of transition colors. I don't really wanna talk about this a whole lot because it feels really self-explanatory, but basically transition colors, no transition colors, huh? Transition colors, no transition colors. Number 27, and this might be contradicting every single thing I have on this list, uh, but number 27 is sticking to the interior design rules too closely instead of just following your heart. Sometimes you just gotta do something and it's maybe not what people would recommend, but like you love it. And you know what? That's honestly all that matters. Number 28, this one hits close to home. And that is having either no plants or too many plants. And I know, I know, I know, I know you're gonna come at me in the comments. I know there are people who are like, there's no such thing as too many plants. Sure, and I was that person who had like 50 plants and that might seem like a lot or a little depending on how much of a like crazy plant person you are but if your space doesn't have any plants it just feels dead obviously to add more life into your space you can add literal 
living things to your space. But the point at which it becomes too many is the point at which it's hard for you to take care of the plants. Number 29 is when there is too much happening visually. There's not enough dead space or white space, and you have mostly open storage, and so everything just feels chaotic and in your face. I'm not knocking open storage because it can look really good, and it also can be really helpful, especially if you have ADHD or something like that. But you know when you see a room that looks like this or this or something like that, and it just, overall, if you just like look at the room as a whole, it's just overwhelming. That's when you know that there's too much happening. Number 30, this is again one of those like very oddly specific things, but patterns that are too big. So for example, small pattern, big pattern. That's what I mean by that. Big patterns are a much more modern way of trying to do pattern, whereas smaller patterns tend to feel a little bit older. This can apply to anything from wallpaper to textiles to tiles to flooring, etc. It's particularly bad when, say for example, you have a wallpaper that has like five repeating patterns on it, and you can very like clearly count the number of repeating patterns. That's not good. Generally, if you lose track of how many repeating patterns there are, that's good. Same goes for tile. If your tiles are really big and your floor of your bathroom is really small, it's not gonna look good. It's gonna look off. That's why those tiny little white hexagons are very common and very classic. Number 31 is not having any built-ins or anything that feels like a built-in. Obviously, if you're renting, this could be a little bit harder to come by, but you can still do DIYs that look like built-ins, but they're actually removable. Number 32, again, another oddly specific thing that I've never heard anyone else mention before is not having any black anywhere in your space. So I'm gonna go on a bit of a tangent here, but I think the reasoning behind this is because of this photography thing that I'm gonna explain because I have a background in photography. And what I've noticed in photography is that when you wanna make a photo feel more aged, vintage, old, nostalgic, you bring the blackest of the blacks up so that they're not as black. That means that when the blackest of the blacks are black, it feels present and in the moment. So when you have a room that doesn't have any black in it, the darkest thing in the room is gonna register in your brain as black. So for example, the room that I'm currently in, there's a brown couch. If that was the darkest thing in the room, it, it was something would just feel off. But a few little pops of black here and there can really help your space feel grounded and present and in the moment. Number 33, when it comes to your furniture legs, not having a good airy to chunky balance. What I mean by that, these are legs that are airy these are legs that are chunky. If you have all airy legs, it's just a lot of lines. But if you have all chunky things, it feels really heavy and weighed down. You gotta have a mix. Number 34. I mentioned this in my last video, linked up here, but exposed light bulbs. If I have to explain this one to you, go watch that video. They're the bane of my existence, so. Number 35. Again, with the balance, not having any curves or straight lines, or having too many curves and straight lines. Especially with this modern organic style that's been popular recently, all curves everywhere is kind of the thing to do. Again, this just comes back to the issue of balance. You should have a balance of some curves and some straight lines instead of only curves or only straight lines. Number 36, this is one that I wish I learned earlier and I just made a video about, which I will also link up here, which is not learning the like super basic electrical skills needed to just like swap out a light fixture. I don't know if you know this, but you can switch out the lights in your rental units. Obviously you have to buy the lights and that costs money, but it makes so much of a difference. Oh, ow, my butt. Number 37. Again, this is probably one of the biggest mistakes on this list, and that is not considering future you when you are designing your space. Whether that's the you who isn't actually gonna fold all of that laundry tomorrow, or the you in six months who's gonna hate that particle board furniture that you got that you spent way too much money on, instead of getting a quality piece of vintage thrifted furniture for the same price. Or the you in five years who's in a drastically different living situation with kids or a partner or a pet. So for example, maybe think about getting like a spill-proof modular couch that can fit into multiple different spaces. Number 38, when you're painting DIY projects, the biggest mistake you could make is not prepping the surface properly and not using a primer that's intended specifically for the material that you are painting. Number 39 is picking materials that are gonna show signs of age quickly. So boucle, 
or solid color fabrics, or white marble, unfinished wood, anything like that. Ideally, you want things that won't show signs of age, or if they do, will be even prettier when they're aged. For example, unlacquered brass. Number 40, I think this is probably just a personal preference, um, but tall headboards that are only as wide as your bed. And I'm sure you're like, but Medora, that's like every headboard ever. But if you have a way to transport it, just get like a piece of plywood, like a four by eight foot piece of plywood, put it behind your bed horizontally, upholster it, screw it into the wall, bam, you got yourself a great headboard. Number 41 is mounting your TV too high, aka above eye level, above the fireplace, where it's like the center of attention, and or just, you know, having a TV at all, because I think TVs are gross and boring, but that's maybe just my personal opinion. So if you're gonna have a TV, at least just don't put it way too high so you're straining your neck looking up at the TV for a whole entire like two hours. Hide it with a piece of art or do something. This is very specific and I think probably at least three people are gonna come for me in the comments, but gallery walls that are specifically in living rooms and bedrooms. Personally, I think that the only accessible spaces for a gallery wall are in hallways, stairways, and small like powder rooms. And in addition to that, when you are doing a gallery wall, not using big enough or small enough art in a gallery wall, because if all of your art is like awkwardly medium sized, it just, it just feels weird. You need to have some contrast, you need to have some large pieces, you need to have some like cute little things, just mix it up. Number 43, we see this a lot here on the YouTubes with other design channels, and that is trying to make your design look expensive. Because if you have to try, it's not going to look expensive. Just focus on good quality things that you genuinely like, if not love, and you're all set. Oh, my butt hurts. Oh. Number 44. Similar to the function that I mentioned earlier, if you're going to be sitting in a couch or a chair, it needs to be comfortable. If it's just a piece of art or like a historical moment or whatever, if you're like rich enough to do that, then sure, whatever, get the pretty thing that you don't want to sit in. But for most of us, it's gotta be comfortable. Number 45, flat weave rugs specifically in living rooms and bedrooms. And yes, that includes Killam rugs. If you're gonna put a rug in a bedroom or a living room, it needs to be at least like medium pile, if not high pile. It feels so much better on your feet if it's not just like flat and gross. Trust me on this one. Number 46, again, a balance issue, which is having too much or nothing that is shiny. And by shiny, I don't mean like mirrored glam, like crystals and shit. It can be, but shiny includes anything that is glass or ceramic that is glazed, metals, shiny stone, things like that. Again, everything is just about balance, really. Number 47, again, oddly specific, but two asymmetrically placed open shelves, often above a toilet. Why can't you just center them? Like, I, I know asymmetry can be really cool. It's not it, okay? Or do like one longer shelf that spans the entire length of the area. I don't, why, why the two? Like if you're gonna do two, at least do three, but, the, and then they're not lined up and it just, one of my pet peeves. We're almost there. <sighs> Number 48 is no acoustic dampening. If you put big rugs and curtains in your space, it'll just feel cozier because the sound won't be bouncing everywhere. And I, I don't know how to explain the science behind it between sound bouncing everywhere and it feeling uncomfortable. But there's just, there's something about a new apartment when you walk in, it just, it doesn't feel like home yet. And part of that is the quality of the sound that's happening in the room. Number 49, not having any flowers, not lighting candles, not cleaning, not caring for it, and not maintaining your home. I know it's really hard to get bogged down in doing the exact same thing day after day and just kind of like zoning out and trying not to care too much because if you care too much, you think you're gonna like just lose it. <laughs> but it really genuinely helps to light a candle every once in a while, to pick a flower on your walk. I think in the Western colonized world, we don't really think of homes as living beings, but it really is. And you can, you can feel it like when you, play loud rock music and open your windows in the spring and you do a bunch of cleaning, it feels so much better to be in the space. And you can tell that there's like new life in the space. And this isn't something that I've fully explored yet, but I think being intentional about how you approach your relationship with your space can really, really help. And number 50, last but not least, the biggest mistake you could make 
by far is beating yourself up about not having a Pinterest worthy home. Most of us aren't celebrities or content creators who need to brand their home to their own personal brand and or it doesn't have to be perfect every single second of every single day. Homes are meant to be lived in. They're going to get messy. They're going to get cluttered and chaotic and disorganized, but part of that is the beauty of life, kind of. It sucks and it's frustrating and it's like not pleasant always, but the messier your home is, the more you're actually living in it. Because if your home looks like a museum, chances are you have way too much money and not enough fun in your life. So that's it. Those are my 50 top mistakes that I see people make all the time. Let me know which mistakes you're making down in the comments below. Oh, and before you leave, I just wanna tell you that I changed the tiers on my Patreon so that now two of them have direct one-on-one -on -one design sessions with me. So I'll link that below in case you want the design sessions or you just wanna support a trans and disabled creator. Um, well, this is awkward because I didn't script an outro. We're just gonna go, bye. Yeah.